انك الذي حب العلا صلى الله عليه وسلم السلام عليكم ورحمه الله وبركاته بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على رسوله الأمين وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين أما بعد Let me start by telling a joke How about that So basically there was this guy and he was uh, he wanted to uh, he was graduating and he was going to check his grade Now overseas you, the university typically will put your grades out on this board and everyone looks for their name and then they see the results so the guy tells his friend he says I can't go to the school but when you go check my grades for me alright and then come to my house and tell me my grades but I'm gonna be sitting with my father so if I failed one grade tell me Muhammad says assalamu alaikum and if I failed two grades say Muhammadan says assalamu alaikum so the guy is sitting with his father and waiting and then his friend goes checks his grade comes back and he tells him Ummat Muhammad says assalamu alaikum to you uh, the reason I chose that joke is it has the word Ummah in it and our, our my next talk is about how this is an, an Ummah that is a moderate Ummah and there are many people who think that Islam is a very strict religion right many people think that that, that Islam is very strict. Are you following young men? Pay attention. So a lot of people think this, especially the young people in the audience, pay attention. Because you think Islam is so strict. There's so many things that I can't do. And that's how you're taught Islam, by the way. You were taught that it's just a list of do's and don'ts. And that's why, and if the adults and parents in the audience could pay attention, that's why when your children ask about Islam, their only questions are halal and haram. Because that's what they think Islam is. A list of things that are halal and a list of things that are haram. Pay attention, young man. Pay attention. Pay attention to what I'm saying. So, a lot of young people think Islam is a list of things that are halal and haram. That's why when young people ask questions, it's only halal and haram. And it's the weirdest and strangest things. Is this halal? Is that haram? And until now, of years of dealing with youth, I have yet to experience a young person come up to me and ask, how do we do this? Where do you put your hands in ruku'ah? How do you do this movement or that movement in salah? It's always halal and haram questions because that's what we teach them Islam is. But it's actually not that and there's always a, a wisdom and a logic to why something is halal or haram. But because that's how we present it to them, in their minds they think Islam is just a list of do's and don'ts. And that's why a lot of young people believe, and a lot of people in the audience might believe, that Islam is just generally a very strict religion. A couple of things. One, the more you learn about Islam, the more you will, you will realize that it's actually not that strict. That there's a lot of leeway in many, many issues. For example, many people, if they get a small paper cut, they think that they have to go and redo the wudu. Many people are like that. They get a small paper cut, they say, okay, I need to make my wudu all over again. But that's actually not the case. You study fiqh and you find that it's a lot more flexible than that. A lot of people think that if you touch a dog, it nullifies your wudu. Or if someone's pet dog touches you on your way to the masjid, it nullifies your wudu. No, it doesn't. If a dog licks your hand or something like that, all you have to do is wash your hand and you go straight to the masjid and you continue with your salah. Uh, likewise, touching a man or a woman, like for example, you have wudu and you go to the grocery store and the cashier lady, as she's giving you the change back, she just touches your palm a little bit. Oh, she ruined my wudu. No, it doesn't ruin your wudu. And the, the only touch from the opposite gender that would ruin your wudu is one that is associated or comes along with desire. And I'm sure when she gave you the change in your hand and, and her finger just touched you lightly, you weren't overtaken with desire or anything like that so it's not uh, it's not as people think it is how about uh, raw meat halal or haram huh haram huh 
Most people think raw meat's haram. The only people who know how to answer this question properly are Lebanese people. Because they have uh, kibbeh, which is uh, raw meat with spices and everything. It's halal. Crocodile. Halal or haram? No, that was a trick. That's haram, actually. I just put that on purpose. Mermaids. Halal or haram? Aha, uh -huh, thank you. Yeah, they don't exist, you're right. But, but uh, if you want to, any, some scholars in the past said, yeah, mermaids are halal to eat and so on. That would be weird, wouldn't it? You have a human torso and you're eating arms and ears. But okay, the, they don't exist. All right, so anyways, the more you learn about Islam, the more you discover that it's flexible and it's not as strict as you think it is. Now, Islam is strict when it comes to issues of belief, issues of aqidah. And you will find it more relaxed when it comes to issues of fiqh and of dealings and acts of worship. So in issues of belief, Islam is very strict. Our belief regarding Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you cannot have any doubt about it. And you cannot have two opinions about Allah azza wa jal. With issues of belief, it's very strict. Are you with me? With issues of belief, it's strict. So... Is there only one God? There's no, you know, ifs, ands, or buts about that. It's strict. And can you have doubt about that issue? You cannot have any doubt in that issue. But can you have doubt whether when I come up from Rukur, do I put my hands on my chest, do my hands go down to my sides? That's, that's more flexible. So you find in fiqh different opinions, there's flexibility. But in issues of belief, Islam is a very strict religion. طيب. Most people also think that there's more haram in Islam than halal. And this is an exercise I, I always like to do. Is there more halal or haram? So if we were to take, for example, the different kinds of materials, are there more halal materials than haram materials? What are the haram materials? Materials, gelatin, what do you wear? Something made of gelatin? Huh? Gold and silk for males. All right, what else? What materials are haram? Huh? Yes. Shout it out. Polyester is haram. Okay. All right. What else? So you can't think of anything because there's so much. But generally, it would be things that are made of pig skin or dog skin. You wouldn't wear something like that, or even the the, the skin of a wolf or fox, that type of animal. But see, all the rest is halal. There is so much halal. Type drinks. What kind of drinks are haram? Alcoholic drinks. Haram. What else? What else? Shout it out. See, you can't. You have to be creative now. Blood, right? Blood, right? No, nobody drinks urine. What's the matter with you? It's not a drink. You have that in your fridge at home? Let me grab a cold one. So. But these are things people typically drink, blood or things that have alcohol. Well, all the rest is halal. How many kinds of other drinks are there? How many kinds of fruit juices are there? Vegetable juices, all kinds of other drinks, halal. You see? So you, when you look at it, you actually find there's a lot more halal than there is haram. But even the things that were prohibited from, there's a wisdom and there's a logic to, to behind why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forbade us from these things. طيب, I want to give you some examples because... Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us in the Quran وَكَذَلِكَ جَعَلْنَاكُمْ أُمَّةً وَسَطًا لِتَكُونُوا شُهَدَاءَ عَلَى النَّاسِ وَيَكُونَ الرَّسُولُ عَلَيْكُمْ شَهِيدًا This verse is saying, and thus we have made you, this Ummah of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, a community that is just, or a just community, a moderate community, in the middle, right? In the middle between what? If you compare Islamic law, to Jewish and Christian law, you will really understand how we're a middle uh, ummah, or we've been, we're just in the, in the middle, we're balanced, we're just, okay? And this is one thing that I want, the only thing that I want you to, to walk away from this lecture with, that we really have a very fair and balanced sharia. So I'm gonna give you examples of Jewish dietary law, and I want you to see how strict it is. Okay, everybody with me? All right, for example, in Jewish dietary law, there are certain parts of permissible halal animals that cannot be eaten. Does this exist in Islam? And is there any part of the sheep that you can eat? 
You can eat all of it. Any part, you can eat it. it can anyone think of a part you can't eat from a sheep? What? I can't hear you. So, but in certain in, in dietary laws, in the Jewish dietary laws, even halal animals, some parts of it cannot be eaten. Also, you have the meat of other birds or mammals cannot be eaten with dairy. It cannot be mixed with anything that's cheese or yogurt or milk. But we can do that. We can mix it the way we want. You can pour milk over your steak and eat it, right? But for them, very strict. And according to some views, and I'm only going over the more or less universal Jewish dietary laws. According to some views, fish cannot be eaten with meat either. Okay? Then the utensils, the cooking pots. If they have come into contact with meat, it cannot be used for dairy. Yani, if your pot has come into contact with meat, you can't boil milk in it, believe it or not. That's very strict. For Muslims, you wash the pot, you put whatever you want to put in it. Everyone paying attention? طيب. Also utensils that came into contact with non-kosher food cannot be used for kosher food. And grape products made by non-Jews cannot be eaten by Jews. Any grape product made by a non-Jew cannot be consumed. For us, is that the case? It doesn't matter who makes the grape product, as long as it's not wine, of course. If it's a Hindu or whoever it is, we can eat it, we consume it. So you see how it's flexible for us. Also for the Jews, shellfish, lobsters, oysters, shrimps, clams, the good stuff. What about it? Crabs, all of it forbidden. All of it forbidden. But for us, it's halal. They have a very strict dietary laws. Also, reptiles. You can't eat reptiles. Can we? What kind of reptiles can we eat? We just said it. Reptiles. Yeah, lizards. You can anyone have lizard in here before? Anyone try a lizard? Nobody? They say it tastes like fish. Yeah? So lizards, you know, imagine if you're a Jew, you couldn't have a good lizard, man. You guys can ha you have that blessing, you have that honor. Also, they can't eat insects. We can eat insects, alhamdulillah. What kind of insects are eaten by, by Muslims typically? Locusts. Locusts, you know what those are? Very, very, very big grasshoppers. So you see then, in their dietary law, everything is very strict for us. Very, very relaxed. Okay. Even in, when it comes to the menses for the women, very strict laws in, 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 in Jewish law. Very, very strict. That in, for a woman during her menses, if, even if she touches something else, that thing becomes unclean. And it can, be, it can contaminate other things. But for us, it's very simple and it's very relaxed. Aisha radiallahu anha would report that during her menses, she would drink from a container. The Prophet would turn it to where she drank from. And he would drink from that part. You know, and in the other hadith, he would show her that how the impurity is not in her hand. And she can touch things. You can sit with a woman in the same bed. But in Jewish law, you cannot do that. Very, very strict. So, you see that Islam, the, the laws in Islam are more relaxed than they are in Judaism, for example. I also want to share one thing with you. This is just for fun. That uh, in Jewish law, there's a prayer that uh, the men say every morning. It's amazing. They say... Praised are you, O Lord, our God, King of the universe, who did not make me a non-Jew. So they're saying, Alhamdulillah, for being a Jew. Just like we say, Alhamdulillah, for being Muslims. Then they say, who did not make me a slave, and who did not make me a woman. <laughs> yeah, they say that every morning, huh? What do you think of that? It's very nice, yeah? Shelo asani goi. Shelo asani avid. Shelo Asani Isha. That's the woman part. <laughs> oh, I love that. Fantastic. Anyways, this is when it comes to Jewish law. That I just wanted you to look at these examples and see how strict Jewish dietary law is. Now, look at the Christians now. So now we went at one extreme end. It's so difficult. Then look at the Christian law. Huh? What's Christian law? You might ask, what law? What law? Everything is allowed. And everybody's just going to jump rope into paradise. It's so easy. You accept Jesus as your savior, died for your sins, you accept him in your life. And that's it. You're guaranteed paradise. You know, they have that belief. Anyone know that? One time I was sitting talking to a, to a Christian person. He said, so in Islam, you guys don't know if you're going to paradise? 
I was surprised by that question. I said, who knows if they're going to paradise? He said, I was like, poor you. It's not how it works. So, uh, for them, dietary laws, what dietary laws? Even though in Leviticus in the Bible it has all the do's and don'ts of what you can and can eat, in, new parts, in, in parts of the New Testament they said, look, it doesn't make you unclean and so on and so forth. So now they eat pork, they eat all kinds of things. They have no, no kind of dietary law whatsoever and everything else is very relaxed. So, we're not like that, and we're not like that. Allah Azza wa Jal now, I hope you would appreciate it more, made us a moderate ummah in the middle. Our laws are not that strict. And in other nations, even if an impurity falls on your clothing, you can't wash the clothing, you have to cut that part off. But for us, it's so much easier and so much more relaxed. I hope you're starting to appreciate how wonderful Islamic Sharia is. Shalom Asani Isha. And type. <laughs> so now I want you to, to focus about a few things in Islamic law. First of all, you find it very balanced. Everything is so balanced. Islam doesn't ask of you to put yourself in a cave or to shun everything from the dunya and to not even gather wealth and to not work hard for it. it just everything is balanced. There's a balance between this life and the next life in Islam. It doesn't tell you to ignore this world and only prepare for the next. And it doesn't tell you just focus on this one and not. There's always a balance. You know, other, other religions you'll find people staying in monasteries or staying, staying in some kind of temple at the top of a hill. And this is their entire life. But we're able to live a normal life under Islamic Sharia. There's a balance between reason and revelation. And Allah Azza wa Jal always explains to us. You throw that thing one more time, I'm going to throw you in the air. You, stop throwing that around. What's the matter with you? Somebody tell that kid to stop that. Everybody pay attention. Didn't fly all the way from Calgary so you guys can mess around. Pay attention. Welcome. Everybody with me? Fantastic. I'm telling you some important stuff here. Now you go to school tomorrow, they start attacking Islam and you don't know. I wish I paid attention. Pay attention now. All right. So we're saying there's a balance between revelation and reason. There's a balance between the individual and the community. There's a balance between the religion and the world. And so Islam always chooses the middle positions in the majority of things. Even, like, even in issues of belief that we said are strict, you find that, you know, again, with the Christians, it's so relaxed. You, believe, you take Jesus as your savior, you basically skip rope into paradise. You know, for the Muslims, you, no one is told, okay, you, you're going into paradise or, or not. This is something you strive for your whole life. You balance between love, hope, and fear. You worship Allah out of love, hope, and fear. Not other people who just have hope. Some people just have fear. But again, we always have a balance. I want you to appreciate the fact that everything is balanced in Islam. Acts of worship, again, very balanced in Islam. You have different opinions. You have leeway. Different opinions make it more relaxed for people. Versus if you look at, as we, as we did with the Jewish law. Also, the, the laws of Sharia, they're all logical and they're all within reason and they're all within your capability and within your capacity. Uh, طيب, let's look at uh, يعني, some examples. Pay attention. Don't make me say that again. If you want to fool around, go outside. Leave now. All right. So... Uh, we were saying in Islamic law, for example, it's so fair and so balanced. There's no obligation beyond your capacity. Can you think of anything in Islam that Allah Azza wa made obligatory upon you and it's beyond human ability to do? It wouldn't make sense. And Allah Azza wa created us. He knows what we can and can't do. He wouldn't ask us of something that we cannot do. True or false? Can you think of anything that Allah Azza wa asked us that we can't do? Maybe there are things we can never perfect, but we can always make a step towards improving them or having some of this aspect, right? So Allah Azza in His law in Islam doesn't ask us of things that are beyond our capacity. Likewise, Allah Azza wa out of His fairness, He makes all the good things permissible and all the bad things forbidden. Everything that's harmful for you, you'll find it to be forbidden. All the things that are good for you, you find it to be permissible. And this is... Uh, then one of also the definitions of the halal thing. 
Halal thing is that, that which agrees with your nature as well. And the forbidden things, you will see the bad aspect in it. Likewise, the, uh, like in conditions of extreme necessity and excuses made for you, because it's a logical sharia. You know, for example, if someone is torturing you to say something that's kufr, can you say it as a Muslim? Yes. Yes. Now, other nations before us, their law was that you had to die with it. So if someone is, is torturing you, we're saying we're going to cut you in half like, unless you disbelieve in Allah. In their sharia, you had to just be cut in half. You couldn't say it to get yourself free. But in our sharia, you can. It, it has the leeway and it has yani, uh, yani, uh, conditions for extreme necessity. Just like you know, you're starving in a desert, you're about to die of starvation. Right? And then you find in the middle of a desert a roast pig and some wine. And you can you eat just a little bit of that pig in order to survive? Right? You can. Why? Because it's fair and it's a just sharia. So you don't find it that it's overburdening people or making things difficult for people. Also, you find that the values in Islam they are universal and it's not specific to a culture not specific to a race and not specific to a country. You find anything like that? Is there any ruling in Islam that's just for Somalis, for example? No. Any ruling for any specific people in Islam? Any specific race or culture? No. It's universal. Very nice and very easy. For example, you don't find uh, also religious classes in Islam. And that there are rulings for this class of people and rulings for that class of people, like you find in many other religions. Again, very universal, no double standards. And it also recognizes, you know, the natural things that you want to enjoy in life. And it teaches you also how to enjoy things, but not to go, not to, to be excessive in it. So it's very logical and very realistic sharia. Really hope that you can appreciate that. It's not like the other, other nations, the sharia is so strict, or others that basically don't even have a sharia. And I know you're probably thinking, well, what's so bad about what the situation the Christians have? That they don't even have laws concerning many things. Yani for example, we can follow a Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam in how he made ghusl, right? And how he made wudu, and how he did the salah. We have ways of how to attain khushu' and salah. But talk to other people of other religions and tell them, Give me steps to get khushu' in salah. You know khushu' focus and being feeling humbled and impoverished in front of Allah. Talk to other religions, tell them how do I get khushu' in salah? Do they have the how? No. If you ever listen to, and I don't recommend it, but if you ever listen to the evangelicals and people speaking on Sunday uh, morning television, they always talk about what we need to do. We need to do this. You need to allow the Lord this into your life. You need this, you need that. But they never show you how. You know why? Because they don't got the how. They don't got it. They don't have the how. They can just talk about what we need to do. But we have that. So you can't ask the followers of all the other prophets, how did Isa alayhi salam make ghusl? They can't tell you. How did Isa alayhi salam improve his khushu' and salah? They can't tell you. And so what happens when you don't have the, the law, you have to make up your own. And that's why in, in Christian history, there are people who started to make up their own laws. You know, St. Augustine and others, they started to invent their own laws because they didn't have it. We have our law that comes from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And because it comes from Allah azza wa it's not oppressive to any group or any peoples. So, and uh, it's very practical as well. Yani Islamic law, it takes into account people's needs, human needs. It takes into account emotions desires, what people wish for, all of that. Very, very nice, very flexible, very logical, not overburdening anyone. And even if there was something that were to overburden you and you were in an extreme situation, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala then does not require from you more than what you can bear. Even then, that's another rule that we have, that Allah azza wa jal only asks from you what you can bear and what you can do. So the truth is that when we don't know our religion, we think it's very strict. We think it's very rigid and we cannot see how it's moderate. But Allah Azza wa made it moderate, placed it in between the Jewish religion and the Christian religion, not that strict and not uh, without any boundaries. He made it a middle religion that takes into account many things 
human needs, desires, all kinds of things, balancing this life with the next life, balancing the religion with this life, fantastic. But like I said, you don't know it, you'll think that it's very strict. You'll think that it's a very difficult religion. And if it's presented to you as do's and don'ts, you will always think this is a strict religion. We can't do this, we can't do that, we can't do this, we can't do that. But then when you look into why you can't do it, you will see that it comes under the umbrella of another good for you and for the community. Let's take one example, for example, dating. You, know, you all know you can't date, right? So, and people just think they can't date and they don't know the reason. And parents, again, in the room, always explain the reason to your children. Your children are smart and they understand things. Don't give them the nonsensical explanation uh, with boogeyman and all kinds of things. Tell them the actual reason. They'll understand it and the religion will make sense to them. I know some young men who would come to me after years of not dating and they'll say, why are we not allowed to date? Or they won't go to the prom and then they'll ask, well, why can't we go to the prom? So it means they just did it because they were told no, but no one explained the wisdom to them. And when you explain the wisdom to someone, it makes it easier for them to accept that and easier for them to follow. Not just that I'm just forbidden from something and I don't know the reason, but I'm just, that's what I'm told, I can't do it, so I can't do it. And then you're going to be constantly met by people in school and approached by people in school who will ask you, why can't you do this? Why don't you do that? And you have to have answers to that. But obviously, if we don't teach our children the answers, then they won't know. And if you teach them the answers, you'll really help them even in the future from obeying Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala better because they know why they're doing something. They know why they're abstaining from the haram. And we are living in the society where people just glorify the haram and they give it nice names, you know. And so the youth will be bombarded with that constantly. But if they know why, it'll make sense to them. Taib. So, know your religion. I'm telling you, the more you learn about Islam, the more you'll see it's flexible, the more you'll understand why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will tell us this and will tell us that. One of the interesting things, just to add that, by the way, is that there is actually, pay attention please, there is not a single narration when the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam ever told the companions or forbade them from something and they asked, is this like haram haram or just makroh? Never, never, ever, ever. You know why? Because there were people ready to obey their Prophet ﷺ. The Prophet ﷺ said, don't do something, they stayed away from it. But today, people, they want to know where it falls so they can just ride the border, you know. Most people, they come to you, they ask you a question like this. Is such and such haram? You tell them, no, it's not haram, but it's makroh. What's makroh? It's disliked or hated by Allah Azza wa Jal. Oh, so it's not haram. Yes, it's not haram, but it's makruh. Okay, okay, but it's not haram. Why? That's all they want to look at. Is, is it haram or not? You know. If you tell them it's makruh, okay, that means I can fool around with it for a good while. The scholars warn of, an, of they say, if you keep falling into the makruh, it will eventually lead you into falling into the haram. If something is disliked by Allah Azza wa Jal, why would you want to do it? Khalas, that's it then. And that's why the companions never asked, is this haram or makroh? Is this haram, haram, or just haram, like, you know, stay away from it? But this is what we do today. You know, something is haram, something is makroh, something is mustahab. Is it mustahab or wajib? Is mustahab? Ah, oh, okay. And Allah prefers that I do it. Okay, great, so I can ignore it then. That's not how it is, people. You know, it's interesting, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he said, ad-deen yusr wa la usr. The religion is ease and not hardship. But subhanAllah, so many times when we look, we find hardship. Who's making it difficult then? If the prophet of this religion said the religion is ease, who's making it difficult? Somebody's making it difficult. So, for sure, right? But the religion is ease. So, it's supposed to be easy and yet we find difficulty. And that difficulty again leads to not understanding the religion or leads to strictness of things that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala did not impose upon us, but we impose upon ourselves these things, you know, such as madahib, all kinds of things. We make it obligatory, you have to pick this, you have to do that. And Allah Azawajal didn't say do that. So the religion is ease and it's not difficulty. If you're finding the religion to be difficult, that means something's wrong. Either you're understanding or, or something you're being taught or your teacher or something like that. The Prophet ﷺ said the religion is ease. It's not, it's not difficulty. It's not difficult. So that means 
you have to find that it's easy at some point. Now the other thing the Prophet ﷺ said, Yassiru wa la tu'assiru, bashiru wa la tunaffiru. He said, make things easy and don't make things difficult. And whether your parents or your children, you stay w within the boundaries of the sunnah as we spoke about in the last lecture. Don't make things difficult for people. And most, things, most people, I, like I said, they think being religious is making things difficult. So they frown, they come to you, brother, this is haram. And they think this is a good religious brother. The guy who frowns to you and he comes and yells to you that this is haram, what you're doing. This is a good guy, you know. But that's not the way of the Prophet ﷺ. And by the way, just when you tell someone something's haram like that to their face, all they do is defend it. Have finesse, diplomacy, style when it comes to giving people da'wah and telling people this is haram or prohibiting people from something. Taib. So uh, with that, I'm going to end here. I think if I make this lecture any longer, yani they'll be either sleeping or there'll be a brawl in the front row. So uh, I know it's been a long day, but uh, I hope yani, you can now focus on looking how, at this, uh, at our ummah as fi'lan, actually a moderate ummah that was placed in the middle. Allah didn't give us an overburdening, very difficult sharia, ah, nor did he not give us any laws and then allow us to make our own laws and oppress each other in the process study your religion you will find that it's easier find out the purposes or the wisdoms behind why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will forbid us from doing something have the arguments in your head be ready to explain it to non-muslims be ready to defend your religion jazakumullah khairan sallallahu wa baraka ala muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in wa assalamu alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh